This video contains spoilers for the entire Project Zero franchise, and due to the nature of the games, this video will be discussing topics that may be distressing to some, and viewer discretion is advised. Also, if you enjoy this video, I'd really appreciate your support over on Patreon. With all that out of the way, let's start the video. In my eyes, there are three classic survival horror franchises. The first is, of course, Resident Evil, the anti-corporate zombie schlock franchise that continues to dominate the genre to this day. The second is the psychological horror weirdness of Silent Hill, which still leads rabid fans to want new entries, despite the fact that it hasn't been good since 2003. And the third franchise is Project Zero, which has never commanded the level of popularity of the other two, but has built a dedicated cult audience behind it since its first appearance in 2001. This cult success is likely down to presentation. Resident Evil and Silent Hill courted an international audience by shamelessly swiping elements from Western horror. Resident Evil owes much of its success to the work of George Romero, while a cursory glance at Jacob's Adder or Twin Peaks gives an insight into where Silent Hill gets its ideas. Project Zero, meanwhile, is unashamedly Japanese. Its horror comes from spooky tales and folklore from around Japan, and its movie influences are in big J-horror stories such as Ring or Duon. Unlike its two bigger cousins, it doesn't shy away from its roots and the heritage of its developers, instead embracing them as a central aspect of its design. It's also my favourite of the three. While I deeply enjoy the first three Silent Hill games and a bunch of the Resident Evil series, I adore Project Zero. The use of ghosts allows for a whole new level of horror where you simply can't escape a zombie by closing a door. No, these incorporeal beings can float through walls, teleport and even attack through the floor, while their shifting, inconsistent appearance can get away with bearing brutal wounds of their horrible deaths in a way that the monsters of other games might struggle getting past senses. I first discovered Project Zero through a PS2 demo disc, and I was immediately captivated by this mysterious haunted house game. I devoured this demo, which featured a small segment of the opening chapter, and I knew that I had to play more. And so, I did. Project Zero came about following the release of Tecmo's Deception on the PS1. One member of the planning team, Makoto Shibata, was having dreams involving supernatural events and believed he'd encountered the supernatural in real life. He decided to turn this into a video game, using rejected ideas from deception of using a traditional Japanese mansion and a concept of things appearing and disappearing off screen to enhance fear. Initially, the concept saw the player using light to combat ghosts, but they decided to shelve that idea for later use and decided to use an old camera instead. The use of a camera harks back to the historical fear that cameras could steal the subject's soul, which is why the camera's design was inspired by an old German military camera, probably from around the era where this idea was still somewhat prevalent. Developed under the title of Project Zero, this was shortened down to Zero for the final Japanese release, a play on the Japanese word Rei, which can be read as both Zero and Ghost. For some reason, the European publisher, a now defunct internet service provider called Wanadu, decided to use the working title, restoring the project portion, and creating a baffling name in a region where the pun no longer works. Its Western releases show how difficult this intensely Japanese game was to market overseas. In Europe, Wanadu leaned into the idea of it being a spooky haunted house where you're going to struggle to fight back. To quote the box, you're not a superhero equipped with powerful weapons, but a vulnerable college girl with only a camera. Abandon all hope because this is scary and hard. It's a true horror experience, unlike those zombie games. In America, where it had some other name that I can't remember, they went in the slightly surreal direction of proclaiming the game was based on a true story. It was not, but this didn't stop them from putting it on the incredibly ugly box art, on the title screen, in all the marketing, and generally anywhere they could feasibly get away with it. If Tecmo of America could have gotten away with inserting title cards after every event to say, hey, this really happened, they probably would have. But if you want to know where this idea of a true story comes from, allow me to quickly break down the real world lore. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. It never happened. 
this one was invented by a writer. The totally real work of fiction, Project Zero, stars Miku Hinasaki, a high school or university student, depending on your region, who ventures into a spooky mansion of legend in search of her brother Mafuyu. <laughs> As we see in the game's prologue, he had gone into the Himaru family mansion up in the mountains in search of his favourite novelist, Jinsei Takamine. What he discovers upon entry is some ghostly activity, some of which results in him being groped at by a mass of hands before we cut to Miku. Miku's journey is a little more successful as she heads in, finds her brother's camera, and then heads deeper into the mansion. And this camera is key to the gameplay. If you're unfamiliar with how Project Zero plays, you wander around rooms of the Himuru Mansion, searching around for clues, keys, and resources to help you survive, much like other games in the genre. But combat uses a camera to battle the various ghosts in a move that's designed to make you face the horror head on. Using the camera puts you in a first person view, and in order to do more damage to the ghosts, you have to keep looking directly at them. Maybe even get up nice and close where they can potentially grab at you with their spectral grip and drain your life force. For really strong shots, you can wait until they're ready to attack and wait until the last minute to do a shot that takes off a chunk of health and pushes the ghost back. It's an effective way of piling up the scares as the camera view limits your vision and you need to look directly into the dead eyes of the warped, mutilated faces of your enemies to get the best chance of defeating them. And when I first played the game, I didn't quite grasp this concept and wasted a lot of the game's limited film resources on basic shots that did little damage. You won't see that in this footage, because I'm a master of the game these days, but trust me, my original playthrough had to be restarted once I figured out how wrong I was in my attempts to use the controls. It's a great premise for a horror game, with the mansion constantly offering a horrifying, oppressive atmosphere, where something lurks around every turn and you can never feel truly safe. And indeed, my first experience with the game was exactly that. I did not feel safe, and it took me a long time to be able to finish it just out of fear and anxiety. It wasn't helped by how poorly I managed my camera resources though, to be fair. Because Project Zero does not hold back in its scares, the use of ghosts as enemies means that they can appear at random, floating through walls to get you. They can even show up in rooms with save points, so you can't even rely on those rooms being safe. And the revelations that you uncover through the game's story don't help this unpleasant feeling. The central ritual that failed and caused all of this is the strangling ritual, where a shrine maiden is tied to posts by her limbs and neck, and then all these ropes are pulled until she is brutally ripped apart. And the bloody ropes tying her are then used to bind a hellgate. And to choose who gets this role, a separate woman is blinded with a mask with spikes in the eyes, who then has to chase after young girls, with the first girl caught becoming the next blinded maiden, and the last girl becoming the next rope shrine maiden who will fulfill their destiny 10 years later. And the reason why the mansion is in such a cursed state is because the last strangling ritual went wrong, and the discovery of this is a big part of the game's storyline. Kyrie, the previous Rope Shrine Maiden, failed to stay isolated for the required 10 years, and instead she met a boy, a visitor to the mansion, and through him she learned that life is pretty great, actually, which meant that she wasn't fully committed to being at the centre of a ritualistic tug of war. This meant the bloody ropes didn't have enough sacrifice energy or whatever to block the forces of evil, and they exploded through the manor, killing everyone and turning them into murderous ghosts. Kyrie herself was brought back as a spirit full of malice, one that you encounter throughout the game, where she's invincible every time. And it's her that causes everyone who enters the mansion to suffer terrible fates too, like Takamine and his team. Miku finds his editor's ghost emerging from a cupboard, his assistant's ghost mangled in a water wheel, and Takamine himself crucified on the ceiling, being groped by the same mass of hands that chased her brother. All of them claimed by Kyrie's malice, and turned into ghosts themselves. And after a brief encounter with Kyrie, Miku herself becomes a minor victim of the curse too, as ghostly ropes begin appearing on her wrists and ankles in a manner similar to the strangling ritual, which suddenly makes the ghost editors ranting about ropes make so much more sense. The game takes place over four chapters, or nights, and each one presents the story of a different group of victims of the house. 
Night 1 is the aforementioned novelist and his team. Night 2 focuses on the fates of the folklorist Ryozo Munakata. This blinding mask is the key to the door. He lived in the house to study it and got claimed by the malice in a spooky ritual room, while his wife Yae hung herself from the stress of being haunted, and his daughter's friends got preyed on by Long Arms McGee here. His daughter survived, conveniently going on to become Miku's grandmother. Night 3 focuses on those who died on the night of the Calamity, whether that was directly through ghostly forces, or at the hands of the family master who survived but lost his mind and went on a katana rampage. As you do. Night 4 focuses on Kyrie herself and the events that led up to the sacrifice failing. It's all very grim, depressing, and constantly full of dread, but there is hope as Miku learns that if she collects the pieces of the holy mirror that shattered on the night of the failed ritual, she can end the curse by reuniting them. The game mostly follows this quest, as Miku battles the ghostly forces within the mansion to find these pieces, usually facing an invincible Kyrie every time she finds one. Miku is ultimately successful in her goal, and defeats Kyrie in a final battle that is brutal for her one-shot kill nature, to the point where it can even defeat emulators in a single blow. However, sadly her brother decides to sacrifice himself to prevent the horrors from ever returning, leaving Miku to return home alone. Ever since that day, I stopped seeing things that other people don't see. Yeah, okay, we'll see about that, Miku. The first Project Zero is a weird one to return to because there are so many shaky elements that hadn't been fully formed by this point. I mean, you've heard the voice acting clips that I played throughout this section. It, it's pretty rough, right? Combat works well, but after playing later games, it's clear how limited it was and how much needed refining. It remains one of my favourite games to this day, though, because the world building, the atmosphere, and even the puzzles are all incredibly compelling and engaging. And even with its limitations, the camera based combat is a real innovation that makes the game stand out. Even being intimately aware of every corner of Himura Mansion these days does nothing to diminish how special Project Zero feels. And then somehow, they made it even better. A lost village. A sequel to Project Zero began development relatively soon after the first, with three elements in consideration. Number one, a lot of players of the first game were too scared to finish it. So Makoto Shibata wanted the story to be more compelling to encourage people to push through their fear. Number two, he wanted the ghosts to be more persistent and leave a lingering impression even after their initial defeat. And number three, producer Keisuke Kikuchi wanted the theme of symmetry to be central to the game believing that the worst tragedies are where things are torn apart, such as twin sisters. The result of these elements was Crimson Butterfly, which switched publishers in Europe to Ubisoft, making it a strange release alongside Beyond Good and Evil, Sands of Time, and Rayman 3, but that's what happened. The story was mostly unrelated to the first game, with teenage twins Miu and Mayo Amakura returning to a childhood play spot, only to get lost in the woods and find themselves trapped in Minakami Village. Or because the localization can't consistently decide to keep the name or translate it, you can also call it the literal translation All Gods Village. It's a dark place lost to time and once you enter, you can't leave, as the twins soon discover. The two twins do some exploring in one of the houses and find evidence of a surveyor who went missing, his girlfriend who tried to find him, and an old spooky camera which, surprise, can be used to defeat ghosts. Which soon comes in handy as the ghost of the girlfriend appears menacingly. But things get much spookier pretty quickly as the full story of the village unfolds. Much like the first game's Himuro Mansion, Minakami Village was host to cruel sacrificial rituals that went wrong, and now the place is cursed. But this time the ritual involves twins, which in the real world make up about 1 in 250 pregnancies, but in Minakami it seems like every other pregnancy involves twins somehow. That's the real mystery here, I feel. After learning of the fates of numerous twins involved in the sacrifices, including the Kiryu twins, Akane and Azami, one of whom is replaced by a creepy doll who always follows you, and the Tachibana twins, the only male twins officially noted, it becomes obvious that one particular pair are central to everything. The Kurosawa twins, Yae and Sae, were the last twins to take part in the ritual, but things went wrong when they tried to escape. 
What is the ritual? Simply put, one twin must kill the other through strangulation. Due to a belief that twins are one soul separated into two, the ritual reunites the soul, and the power of this reunion appeases the hellish abyss that's found under the village. However, Sae and Yae attempted to escape thanks to help from Itsuki, the surviving Tachibana twin, and a visiting folklorist's apprentice, Ryozu Munikata. But Sae fell back, was sacrificed alone by the elders, and the abyss got mad and spilled horror on everyone, including Sae's ghost. Yae escaped with Ryozu, where they would go on to marry and eventually die in the first game. This is why I said the story was mostly unrelated. This is the only real connection though, for now. As Miu and Mayu venture through the village, both Sae and Yae's spirits cling to the sisters, attempting to replay the night of the failed sacrifice in hopes of repeating it successfully this time. This leads to Mayu limping off chasing after butterflies and generally getting herself possessed by Sae, while Mio desperately tries to find her, fending off ghosts in the process. Gameplay wise, Project Zero Two is much the same as the first. You have the fixed camera angle exploration, as was the style at the time, and the camera based combat which has been significantly improved for this game. Movement is easier, much closer to a traditional FPS in its feeling, and the options and upgrades for the camera have been increased and refined. The core is the same as the first game, but it just feels better, you know? Ghost attacks are also a little more varied this time around. You've got plenty of ghosts that acted similarly to the ones from the first game, but they really played around with the concept this time around. The drowned woman who floats around like she's swimming, even swooping up through the floor to get you. The doll maker who uses his creations as floating allies. The doll twins where you have to study their movements carefully to cause damage to the human rather than the doll. The priests who hide and teleport around the place, making them tricky to pin down and the villagers who crowd around you and try and split your attention between them. They're all interesting and challenging in their own unique ways, and it creates a whole set of memorable enemies that stick with you long after the game's finished. It also manages to avoid being an escort mission despite all the pieces being there. In chapters where Mayu didn't have to run an important ghost errand, I'm sorry. She will follow Mio at all times, but due to her having a leg injury from childhood, she can't move as fast. But the game will mercifully spawn her into rooms as you advance, so you don't have to stand around waiting for her, and she seemingly can't be killed by ghosts either. She can be attacked, but this just makes her a useful decoy in getting high level shots without risking Mio herself. So in a way, you're encouraged to use her as bait instead of protecting her. Hmm. There's definitely plenty wrong with Mayu though, as she frequently gets clingy, but whether this is down to Sae's possession or not is unclear. However, Mio, don't go too far. when you've moved about two steps away from her early on is a little extreme. I'm right here. Calm down. And it's these improvements along with a much stronger story that make Project Zero Two the best game in the series for me. Everything that made the first game so good is here and improved as much as possible, while the story feels more coherent than the first game. It's no longer just a bad thing happened which led to more bad things, let's go through those things backwards. Instead, it's a triumph of world building, no longer about a single ritual, but about the effects of that ritual on a community built around it. The tragedy the ritual creates, the way it turns people into monsters, and the weird ways that the village was built around twins for their sacrificial purpose, from the connected houses to the split paths leading down into the abyss. Both games were focused on folklore, but while the first game was all about lore, the second is all about the folk. There's a real sense of tragedy from every character. The father of the Kiyu twins falls into madness upon seeing how sad his surviving daughter is, especially as she spends a lot of time repeating the mantra of Why do you kill? The doll ghost that we face is a strange haunted creation he made in an attempt to bring back his daughter's spark. You feel sorry for him and you feel sorry for the twins, especially being forced to do something so horrific at a really young age. The surveyor at the start of the game is an innocent victim wrapped up in the malice of the area's curse, much like our protagonists. He's literally just a man doing his job, assessing the land for a potential dam being built in the area. The fact he never returns home and no one can find out what happened to him leads to his worried girlfriend undergoing the same fate. The folklorist who comes to the village to learn about the traditions of the area is also an innocent bystander, someone who is welcomed with open arms and then killed as a backup sacrifice when Sae and Yae go missing. He did nothing wrong and just died 
due to his own curiosity. Even the Kurosawa family head, the man at the heart of this ritual and all the heartbreak that comes with it, is sympathetic. There is plenty of evidence that he doesn't like having to offer his daughters up to sacrifice, but as we see from the failure of the ritual, he doesn't have a lot of choice in the matter. Rather than the mad katana man that was the family head in the first game, the Kurosawa family head is presented as a conflicted man, one that can't escape his duty because it could, and did, lead to catastrophe. Project Zero was a collection of spooky things thrown into a mansion, while Crimson Butterfly is all built around its ritual and comes together as a cohesive whole a lot better. This all comes together for Mio and Mayo themselves at the end, too. See, in the first game, Miku finds her brother, who turns to the evil spirit behind it all and says, Wait! I can fix her! You go home! And it all feels a bit abrupt. But in the second game, with Mio and Mayo forced to undergo the ritual, it makes it much more personal to the characters, and leaves them making a sacrifice that seemingly can't be avoided. And unlike the first game's ending where Mafuyu's sacrifice is just casually brought up at the last minute, the second game's ending is signposted from the moment that Mayu gets possessed. You can see it coming the entire time through the villagers stories and Mayu's increasingly unhinged behaviour, and a big part of the horror comes from a desperate hope that maybe you can avoid the grim fate. A hope that is ultimately useless. As you can probably tell, I absolutely adore Project Zero 2, but the question is, how could they possibly follow this up? The third game in the series, subtitled The Tormented, released in 2005, two years after Crimson Butterfly. And once again, it changed publishers in Europe, this time to Take-Two Interactive, meaning it shared a publisher with Grand Theft Auto San Andreas for that year. The Tormented brought about a few changes to Project Zero. While the game was still focused on camera-based gameplay and fixed camera angle exploration, the structure and story changed drastically. The protagonists of the previous games had been teenage girls trapped in a dangerous place, but in this one the protagonist is a grown woman, and she doesn't go to the horror, it comes to her. Rei Kurosawa, seemingly unrelated to the family at the head of Minakami Village in Crimson Butterfly, is a professional photographer with a successful career and a wonderful relationship with her fiancé, Yu Aso. However, all this came to a halt two months prior to the game's events, as the couple got involved in a car accident while she was behind the wheel. Ray survived, but you did not, leaving her suffering from grief and guilt. And this grief is the source of the game's horror. Following an assignment at an abandoned manor house, she discovers Yu's image on a photo, and soon begins to have recurring nightmares about a crumbling mansion in perpetual snowfall. In this mansion, she encounters other victims of grief being lured into the manor by mysterious forces, including an aggressive tattooed woman who chases Ray down. This causes her to wake up feeling the sting of similar tattoos appearing on her own body. Ray decides to put her photojournalistic instincts to good use by looking into what she dreamed about, with help from her assistant and roommate, Miku Hinasa- Hey, it's her! Together, they discover that the people in Ray's dreams are all real people who have been disappearing, and that there are legends of a manner of sleep, where people see their dead loved ones soon fall into a coma, and also die. And Rei has already fallen victim to the same curse, a curse that she is determined to investigate and stop before it claims her entirely. Project Zero Three has a much more intimate and personal story than its predecessors, and that works heavily in its favour. Rei suffers from grief over the loss of you, and she is being preyed upon by supernatural forces because of this. To enhance this intimacy, we spend a lot of time with Rei in her own home, meaning we'll learn more about her as a character than previous protagonists, simply by seeing how she lives and expresses herself in her spaces. We also learn a little more about Miku as she's back, as we can snoop around in her bedroom as well, and we also learn that she's into amateur meteorology. It's raining again. It's raining again. It's raining again. It's raining again. 
This also enhances much of the horror as the ghosts start showing up in Ray's home outside of the dream. The idea that the home is a safe haven from danger gets disrupted. Even the shower scenes where Ray is at her most vulnerable add to this as the supernatural continues to harass her. They're even handled in a way that manages to avoid them feeling exploitative and for titillation as they're not really sexy scenes at all despite the nudity, which is quite impressive. All this leads to a very different feel to the previous games. While the first two games were excellent haunted house simulators, the Tormented is a deeply personal story about loss and guilt, one that hits hard in many ways. Ray is a deeply sympathetic character, and it's hard not to see the manner of sleep as a metaphor for how we can't let grief consume us, a concept literally illustrated with a house that slowly erodes someone's entire essence and leaves them as ashen husks. We also see this reflected in the game's main antagonist and the ritual that created her. In a more surreal ritual this time around, Reika Kuze takes on the mantle of a shrine maiden who sees the sorrows of others literally carved into her skin as tattoos. The ritual involves her being impaled into a shrine where she must lie until she drifts to sleep, taking those sorrows with her into the afterlife. The concept of grief is reflected so clearly in this ritual, one where people dump their sorrows on a sacrificial lamb so that they don't have to deal with them. And when it all goes wrong, thanks to the murder of Reika's lover, someone she was forbidden from seeing, her vengeful spirit not only takes on the sorrows of others, but preys on them. It's all a superb metaphor about dealing with tough emotions, and while the ritual itself feels overly complicated in the lore, conceptually it actually holds together. Reika even gets presented as a mirror to Rei herself, even down to sharing similar names and the same voice actors. And by bringing it all into a dream world, it allows those more metaphorical and surreal aspects to shine. But it's not just about Rei, as for the first time in the series, there are multiple playable characters. In fact, this game would set a precedent for what would come. A main girl, a side girl, and a slightly useless boy, all wrapped up in the spookiness for their own interlinking reasons. While Rei takes up most of the focus as the main girl, some chapters, or hours as the game calls them, star our old favourite Miku as the side girl, as she pursues the memory of her brother into the manner of sleep, and Kei Amakura as the boy, a friend of Yu's whose niece Mio is wrapped up in the curse as she feels guilt over the loss of her twin sister Mayu. Yes, those two. Kei himself gets caught up in the curse as he investigates and pursues his niece into the manor. They even manage to differentiate these three characters in significant ways. Miku seemingly has a stronger spirit energy thanks to her past experiences and can slow down ghosts at any time, as well as being a small woman who can fit into tiny spaces where terrifying crawling ghosts reside. Kei, meanwhile, is a big strong man who can move furniture around, but is also a lot more hopeless at dealing with ghosts and spends more time hiding than fighting. That's why he's the semi-useless boy. Aside from this, the gameplay remains largely the same. Similar puzzles and combat are found throughout. Although navigating the manner of sleep is sometimes harder than Minakami or the Himuru Mansion, simply because the layout is a non-Euclidean nightmare at the best of times. It's a building working off the logic of dreams, pulling in locations relevant to those affected by its curse. For instance, Miku starts out in the entrance hall of the Himuru Mansion, and finds herself walking through various other rooms from the first game, usually in completely different places to where you'd expect to find them originally. Kei experiences something similar as various locations from Minakami show up in a seemingly random configuration. This, however, is also the principal issue that I had with the third game. It can often feel unclear where you're supposed to go, leading to a lot of wandering around aimlessly, which kind of becomes hell in later chapters when the miasma really kicks in, and you need to collect purifying candles to hold it off. This leads to you constantly being put into a timer which makes exploration significantly harder when it runs out. It's a mechanic that sadly turns the game from scary into frustrating. But this doesn't prevent the game from continuing the same level of quality set by its predecessors more generally. The combat remains much the same as the previous games, with an even stranger set of ghosts to deal with, such as obnoxious priestess children, a matriarch who quite literally throws hands, and a creepy hairbrushing woman who you will encounter many times. The ghosts aren't quite as memorable across the board as the previous game, but they still have their own charms. Project Zero Three ultimately ends up capping a superb PS2 trilogy, even tying the other two games into its story and creating a cohesive collective package. As far as I'm concerned, these three games are a requirement for horror fans to play, and it's hard to know where they could have taken it from here. 
The answer was to make some much more significant changes. A year after the release of Project Zero Three, Nintendo released the Wii to a wave of excitement as everyone and their nan wanted to waggle a stick around in order to pretend they were playing tennis. It was a system that took the world by storm, and it was to be the next place that Project Zero would make its appearance. You see, series producer Keisuke Kikuchi loved the motion controls and figured they would be an exciting addition to his horror series to bring players closer to the action and scare them even more. And so, he and his team approached Nintendo about whether they'd be interested in seeing Project Zero 04 on their system. Despite the push for a more family-friendly image, Nintendo were also doing something else with the Wii, allowing obscure, heavily Japanese projects to thrive in the background. Project Zero 04 fit exactly into that niche, and not only were Nintendo up for it, they also negotiated with Tecmo to gain partial ownership of the IP, ensuring that it and future titles would remain Nintendo exclusive for the duration of the deal. Nintendo would also assist in development, but they wouldn't be the only external team to get roped in. Somewhere along the way, Goichi Suda got involved, better known to the public as Suda51. He and his team at Grasshopper Manufacture had been working on No More Heroes for the Wii, and Nintendo roped them into co-developing the new horror game. Despite Suda's dislike for horror, especially ghosts, he ended up agreeing and co-wrote the script and co-directed with Makoto Shibata. Tecmo mostly focused on the gameplay mechanics, Grasshopper took over character motion, and Nintendo focused on general aspects of production. The game eventually released in 2008 in Japan, exclusively for the Wii, and as it would soon become clear, exclusively for Japan. As would become a trend during the Wii era, Nintendo of America didn't want to touch any of the weird Japanese stuff, meaning a release in the US was never going to happen. Nintendo of Europe were more open to the weird Japanese stuff, but unlike later titles like Xenoblade, The Last Story, and Pandora's Tower, Project Zero Four's localization never got finished, ensuring that the game would never see the light of day in the West. And before you say anything, Project Rainfall only succeeded because the UK dubs of those games already existed. You're welcome, by the way. For me, this lack of a Western release for Project Zero Four was a huge blow. I love the series, and learning that its fourth instalment would never see the light of day in the UK was upsetting, and I would spend 14 years mourning my inability to play it. Sure, some dedicated fans had made an unofficial localization, but using it involved importing a copy of the game from Japan, and then hacking the Wii to install it, and I wasn't willing to do that. Until I decided to make this video, and realising that I simply couldn't leave a black hole in this spot, I sat down and decided to figure out how to make the Dolphin emulator work, with the fan translation hacked into the ROM itself, and a PS4 controller taking the place of a Wii remote. It's not the ideal way to play it, but what else could I do? They're not going to release this in the West, it's time that I accepted that. So this section isn't so much a retrospective as it is a review of a game that I recently played for the first time, and not exactly in its optimal form either. Project Zero Four, whose subtitle translates to Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, is familiar in many ways, while in others it's very different. The main difference is the perspective. The original fixed camera setup of the original trilogy is gone, replaced by an over-the-shoulder view that every game since Resident Evil 4 is required by law to have, and this does change a few elements of the gameplay to accommodate. There are also some ways the story operates that stray from the formula set in past games. But beyond that, it's still a Project Zero game. It's still a game about ghosts, it still involves a paranormal camera, and it's retained the three protagonist structure of the previous game. This time our main girl is Ruka Minazuki, our side girl is Misaki Aso, and our semi-useless boy is Choshiro Kirishima. Both Ruka and Misaki are girls who were rescued from a kidnapping attempt as children, with Choshiro as the detective who found them on the mysterious Rogetsu Island. All three of them return to the island years later, drawn back by strange incidents and missing memories. What's also interesting about the three protagonists is that while Ruka and Misaki play a lot like the previous games, Choshiro doesn't even have a camera. That's right, our semi-useless boy's useless trait is the fact that he doesn't have the central weapon the series is entirely built around. Instead, he uses a flashlight. That's right, he beat Alan Wake to the punch by two years. 
Mask of the Lunar Eclipse does take a little getting used to at first. The controls feel a little stiffer this time around, largely down to the fixed camera angle. The first person camera controls also feel more limited because the game wasn't built for a twin stick FPS style control scheme, as left and right on the nunchuck help with the awkwardness of motion controls instead of providing sidestepping. Choshiro is especially strange due to his weapon choice. It can take a while to figure out how the charge of the light beam works and my initial battle against a team of ghosts saw me running out of energy because I didn't understand how to recharge it. And sadly, you can't just pick up some energizer and be on your way. It also has a weird quirk where you can technically take photos with it, but you have to equip a specific lens that isn't very good to use in fights, so you spend a lot of time in the camera menu swapping it out, which is annoying. Oh, once you get used to the changes though, there is a lot to like here. The over the shoulder angle as you move around the hospital makes everything feel claustrophobic, with narrow hallways and tiny rooms giving you little space to run, and the tank controls actually add tension to the movement, adding to the spookiness. These small spaces make it harder to maneuver yourself to avoid attacks from the walls as well, because, well, most of the time you're within grabbing distance of a wall. The story retains the personal touch that the Tormented added, as both Ruka and Misaki are uncovering aspects of their past that they've forgotten. They're both returning to a childhood home where something terrible happened to them. And just like Rei's torment from losing a loved one, the horror of being unable to remember an event that required the police turning up to save them is much closer to the real world than the presence of a haunted house. Most of the game is set in the island's hospital, split into a standard medical wing, and Rogetsu Hall, a psychiatric care wing where Ruka, Misaki, and their fellow kidnapped girls also stayed during their childhood due to exhibiting signs of a mysterious illness, which we'll get to in a second. And I have to say, I'm impressed with how Rogetsu Hall is presented. See, normally horror games present psychiatric care as grotty asylums where patients are effectively tortured forever, but Mask of the Lunar Eclipse throws that out entirely. Instead, Rogetsu Hall is actually pretty nice. It has the feeling of a hotel, albeit one that has nurse stations. The rooms are comfortable and patients are allowed to decorate them how they see fit, which provides a lot of visual variety when exploring them. They even let the creepy girl hang doll parts from the ceiling. Isn't that nice? It's just really refreshing to see a horror game present psychiatric care in a way that's not horrific, and I'm impressed by this. Like, I shouldn't be, because this should be the norm. I also enjoyed how the game separates the two aspects of the story. Ruka and Misaki are here to learn about their pasts, and their goals are focused on that, meaning that during their chapters we learn exclusively about them and their pasts as we uncover information. But Shoshiro's story focuses on retracing his steps when he tracked the girls the first time, and he spends time looking at the larger picture, including the details of the game's spooky ritual. This segmented way of telling the story justifies the multiple protagonists, allows the personal stories to hit harder, and the factual information learned in Alan's chapters exists to gradually recontextualize the prior disjointed info we'd picked up on. Uncovering the secrets of the island is a bit of a slow burn, but there is a lot going on and it can be a little difficult to piece it all together. From what I managed to put together, the moon is haunted, of course it is, but only on this specific island, and it causes people's faces to distort in a condition known as Lunar Sedata Syndrome, that mysterious illness I was talking about. A ritual was done historically that involved two identical dances being performed above and underground, although it seemed to be more of a helping spirits move on ritual rather than a hold back the weird moon disease ritual. I wasn't entirely clear on this. Anyway, the island fell to the horrors a few years prior as a doctor attempted to emulate a failed ritual of the past to discover what happened. Ruka and Misaki were part of a group of kidnapped girls forced to become the Kanade, young dancers who each play a specific instrument as part of the dance, while the main dancer, the Utsua, does the more complex moves that make up the main portion of the ritual. On this occasion, the Utsua was Sukuya Haibara, the daughter of the hospital's head doctor. She was made to wear the Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, a mask made with human skin and designed to block out her personality during the dance. However, the mask instead caused Sukuya to succumb to Lunar Sadata and lose her face, exploding the mask and killing the mirror ritual dancers above ground. Sukuya and the Kanade all fell into a coma, and while the kidnapped girls were found and taken home, Sukuya was isolated a bit before waking up and spreading Lunar Sadata to everyone else on the island, killing them all. It's vastly different to the rituals of past games, which usually involve deliberate suffering. This one's just a ritual dance, and it's only the failure that caused suffering, which is actually a nice change of pace for the series. 
It also leaves a whole bunch of mystery wide open, as the production of the mask only happened twice in recorded history, it's not clear where the idea for it came from, and the Lunar Sedata Syndrome wasn't the direct result of the ritual, it just seemingly has no clear origin. And it's these mysteries that make Mask of the Lunar Eclipse just that little bit spookier. I really enjoyed Mask of the Lunar Eclipse actually, but I feel it, I could have liked it more. The forced use of an emulator meant the cutscenes were usually messed up with audio and video out of sync, the controls were awkward as I had to trick the game into thinking a DualShock 4 was a Wiimote and nunchuck combo, and while the fan translation was generally excellent, sometimes in-game text would display badly, sometimes missing information entirely, which might be why I feel like I missed parts of the story while I was playing. I would really prefer an official release that would iron out a lot of these issues. So it's a real shame that the game will absolutely never get a release in the West. The forbidden story begins. What? So, yeah, while I was scripting this video, the announcement that I never expected to come came. Project Zero, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, is now getting an official localization, releasing on all platforms in early 2023. Based on the trailer, it looks like they've massively improved the visuals too, and with the game getting an Xbox release, a system without gyro controls, it's likely the control scheme will get a massive overhaul too. Here's hoping the game's glitch ghost list will be fixed too. As a result, I have a confession to make, I never actually finished Project Zero 4. I had one final chapter to get through when this announcement was made, and due to my frustrations with the awkward emulation issues, I decided, do you know what, I'm just going to hold off and wait for the official release to play it properly. So I can't give a full final verdict on the game just yet, but no doubt I'll make some sort of short video about it after I've played that version. Because yes, I will be buying this remaster, I've waited 14 years for it to happen, I'd be stupid not to support the move. However, we have another game to talk about. The Nintendo partnership continued for a few years, with a strange DS spin-off named Spirit Camera that I've never played and was apparently bad, and a Wii remake of Project Zero 2 which did manage to escape to Europe, although I also haven't played it. But it would take until the next console generation for a true sequel to emerge. Nintendo followed up the Wii with arguably one of the worst attempts to launch a console in history right there next to Xbox's strategy of selling a games console by telling you how much TV you could watch through it. Following the release of the Wii with a console with a similar name and only promoting it with its tablet-style controller, audiences were thoroughly confused and thought it was an utterly unnecessary controller for the Wii, so a few people bought it. However, this tablet controller had potential for Project Zero. The series had already played with motion controls and the concept of using a handheld screen as the actual camera viewfinder, and here was the perfect opportunity to take those ideas further. The Wii U gamepad was ideal for players to use as a camera obscura in their hands, holding it up to the screen and moving it around like you're hunting for the ghost yourself. And so, we get the central game mechanic of Maiden of Blackwater, the fifth game in the series. Released exclusively for the Wii U due to the continued exclusivity agreement, Tecmo roped in another co-development team yet again. This time they went internally and brought Team Ninja on board, best known at the time for the Dead or Alive fighting games and the Ninja Gaiden series, although these days you might also know them for Neo. Which is also why there's a bonus selection of missions unlocked after beating the main game where you play as dead or alive fighter Ayane as she stealths around ghosts, flashes a torch at them and largely achieves nothing important. I played through it, it adds nothing to the main story, it's not even that interesting to play, it's just... there. I wonder if I'd care more if I'd ever played a dead or alive game? <laughs> Who knows. That aside, a secondary mechanic was also implemented. After Makoto Shibata visited LA in 2008, he felt his ability to sense ghosts was dulled somewhat in the dry desert atmosphere, and latched onto the idea that ghosts and dampness go hand in hand. This resulted in the creation of a dampness meter, one that would lead to increased ghost encounters the wetter characters got. A concept that probably got Team Ninja excited when it was suggested, but um, I'm getting ahead of myself. The game's setting pulls from numerous real-life locations, such as Mount Osore, where a shrine to the dead sits in a volcanic caldera, 
The Tojimbo Sea Cliffs, a location believed to be haunted by a vengeful monk who attacks during storms, and Aoki Gahara, colloquially known as the Suicide Forest because of the sheer number of people who go there to end their own lives, or go to film the bodies because they're inexplicably popular social media ghouls. Collectively, these places were combined into Mount Hikami, a hotbed for supernatural activity that used to be a major tourist attraction, now fallen into disrepair. Once again, we have three protagonists. Yuri Kozakata is the main girl, a girl who has experienced supernatural happenings since a car accident that killed her family as a child, and now lives with a woman named Hisoka Kurosawa, who saved her life. The side girl is Miyu Hinasaki, and no, I didn't just mess up that name, this is the daughter of our favourite protagonist and weather enthusiast Miku, who has gone missing on the mountain and her daughter is trying to find her. And our semi-useless boy is Ren Hojo, a researcher and historian investigating happenings on the mountain, while often chasing his tomboy assistant whenever she frequently disappears. There are some serious parallels with Project Zero Three here. We have a car crash survivor suffering from guilt, a researcher who spends his time chasing a young woman into spooky places, and a girl who calls Mifuyu Daddy. Yuri even lives with a woman whose surname is Kurosawa, just like Rei, although despite the wiki's insistence, there is no confirmed link between the two. The game even imitates the tormented structure, as the crew all venture into a spooky location, then return home and gather what they've learnt. The only difference is, is while the third game saw the ghosts invading the protagonist's dreams, in the fifth, they're physically going up the mountain, which I will admit does dull the horror a little when they're all able to nip back home every night for some proper rest. Well, mostly proper rest. In fact, if I'm gonna be brutally honest, this is only one of the flaws of Maiden of Blackwater's story. While there is an attempt to add personal stakes again, it doesn't quite hold together as well as previous games because the personal stakes are usually, I need to find someone close to me, and then they find them, and then the person goes back to the mountain because of ghosts, and so they have to be rescued again. I lost count of how many chapters have find Hisoka Kurosawa or find Rui Kagamiya as objectives. There's also a bit of a weird treatment of women in this game, and yes, I know some of you are going to complain that I'm talking about this, but I'm talking about it anyway. Project Zero is an intensely female franchise, with every lead protagonist and even every lead villainous ghost being teen girls or young women. There's even an implication that women are just better than men at sensing supernatural activity running throughout the series, which is why the boys are always semi-useless. I'm not exactly saying the series is a bastion of feminism full of empowering narratives, it's just usually pretty good at writing female characters reasonably well. The third game is a really good example of this. It made in Blackwater, however, this is less prominent, and far too often most of its cast is reduced to wilting damsels, while Ren sits up being the heroic man to save them all. Except this is Project Zero, so he's the semi-useless boy, and his prominent useless trait is how sleepy he is, and how often he simply fails to stop the ghosts spiriting the girls away yet again. I can't help but feel that this is Team Ninja's influence, whose experience writing female characters includes perfecting the jiggle physics of Dead or Alive Volleyball, or ruining Samus Aran. So this time we end up with a bunch of characters who just feel... flat. Speaking of which, while the personalities may be flat, something else certainly isn't, because Team Ninja's influence can also be seen in how much the women of this game are needlessly sexualized. Yes, they added DOA's jiggle physics to characters who you mostly see from behind, in a manner that operates in a way that real breasts simply don't. Important development time was spent on this weird jelly that these women hide in their shirts. Just think about that for a second. And remember that I said there was a dampness mechanic? Yeah, this is a mechanic that I refer to as the wet t-shirt mechanic because, oh boy, does that feel like the only reason this was included. Don't get me wrong, there is a great concept here. Avoid water, it attracts ghosts. Also, the mountain is full of hot springs, rivers, and streams to make that hard. Also, it frequently rains. It's a really neat idea for a horror game. It's raining again. But then you see the sodden clothes of the protagonists, and you just... <sighs> Let's take these frilly outfits and soak them until they're practically see-through and riding up into every crevice of the body. But not on Ren, of course. He just looks mildly damp and drips a bit, so I see what you're doing here. It's very blatant. And naturally, Ayane gets this treatment in her side mission as she wears trousers that are just falling down her butt. Look, I say this as someone who enjoys seeing female bodies as much as the next guy. I just don't need this so prominent in a horror game about a ghost mountain where people end their own lives. There's a time and a place and all that. It's just jarring next to the game's general atmosphere. It comes across as a little bit tacky. But the real 
questionable decision here is Miku. I already hinted at this, but Miku's dad is revealed through the course of the game, and if you're wondering why he's absent, it's because he sacrificed himself to protect a shrine maiden in Himaru Mansion. And if you're thinking, wait, wasn't that Miku's brother? then congratulations, you've zoned in on exactly what's wrong here. Yeah, Miku and Mifuyu have a child together, a child who's half ghost because the conception happened during Project Zero Three. You know that heartfelt ending where Rei says her final tearful goodbyes to her deceased fiancé? Maiden of Blackwater decided that that really heartfelt ending needed to be ruined by telling us all that a little bit further down the beach, Miku's tearful goodbyes to her brother's ghost involved more sex than should happen with either ghosts or siblings. And what's more, instead of every other character saying, hey, Miku, what is wrong with you? Everyone just kind of accepts this as if it's normal. Miu's good ending even features a heartfelt discussion about the bond that they shared. Girl, you did the nasty with your dead brother. Stop that, please. I legitimately don't know who at Tecmo thought this was a good plot thread, and frankly, I hope that they get the help that they need to process whatever it is they're going through. Sure, Miku was close to her brother, as established by past games, and there's nothing wrong with an incredibly close bond between siblings, but as a general rule, most of those sibling bonds don't involve sexual attraction. Like, I get they wanted to bring Miku back to tie the game to the rest of the series, but they could have done this so much better. The concept of a ghost baby is also an interesting one, but they could have explored it without the incest. If only a past game had someone encountering the ghost of someone, it would be a lot more acceptable to conceive a child with. Like, I don't know, a woman and her fiancé, perhaps. And yet, despite all these glaring issues, I still really like Maiden of Blackwater. The gameplay is solid and the use of the gamepad is surprisingly intuitive. The game effectively controls somewhere between the original trilogy with the perspective of the fourth game. Switching to camera mode involves a push of the button which places a detailed camera view on the gamepad screen and gyro controls help to move the camera around. It's honestly one of the best implementations of the gamepad, a controller that is notoriously awkward to get working properly, but this just works in the way that it's intended. It really does feel like you're holding a camera up, it's great. The mountain is also just a really cool environment to explore, a place that shows so many signs of being a functional place if it wasn't for all the horror. You've got an old crumbling inn for people to come and enjoy the hot springs. You've got a creaky old cable car system that moves between all the key spots. You've got an old unfinished tunnel construction site left abandoned when everyone got eaten by ghosts. It just adds some refreshing variety to the series alongside the typical shrines and ritual sites that we expect. The ghosts are also an interesting bunch this time around. Our main villain is presented as much more complex this time around, conflicted as she's placed in her role as an undying pillar against the tide of Blackwater and constantly sitting somewhere between evil and good. She honestly gets more complexity and nuance than any of our main cast. Other ghosts are highlights. Shrine maidens are common, coming in multiple varieties, including one that just floats around like she's in water, which is cool. Men ensnared by the black water flail around like erratic zombies. Flame priests provide a stressful combo when they start healing each other. Dolls sneak menacingly around just for the sake of menacing you around corners. And there's even a creepy pasta that snuck into the game as this absurdly tall woman makes appearances. This is the Japanese equivalent of a new Silent Hill dropping a Slendy in at random, but you know what? I dig it. The whole game just feels enjoyable to play. Characters feel a lot less stiff than in previous games, especially with the run button, which has gone from a light jog in past games to just absolutely booking it in this one. The camera obscura controls alone make this much more enjoyable. And the story, for all its faults, has a lot of interesting elements, like the creepiness of ghost marriage, the notion of solemn eternal duty for the Shrine Maidens, and the mountain itself being full of stories of death and sorrow that make it feel like a more ominous presence in the world than the more closed off locations of past games. My feelings on Maiden of Blackwater are complicated, then. It's got one of my favourite locations in the whole series in Mount Akami, and the gamepad controls are actually a lot of fun to play around with. Even the dampness mechanic creates tension as you do your best to stay dry, and rainy nights become unnerving as you expect to be jumped in every second. It's just a shame that the mechanic is also an excuse to model sexy women in tight, wet clothes, and that the plot is all over the place. I have so many issues with Maiden of Blackwater, and yet I still love it as much as I do the rest of the series. And that's that for the series. Since the release of Maiden of Blackwater, things have gone fairly quiet. 
In fact, the only real announcement related to the series for the longest time came from an unexpected source. Yeah, I didn't see this coming. Project Zero has representation in Smash Brothers Ultimate, as Yuri is an assist trophy taking pictures of fighters with the camera obscura, which appears to be the last thing to emerge out of Nintendo and Tecmo's partnership, as the 20th anniversary decisively confirmed the end of exclusivity, as Maiden of Blackwater got a re-release not just on Switch, but also on Steam, PlayStation, and Xbox. And there are even a few costumes referencing the rest of the series, although no sign of the rest of the actual games in that series showing up on modern systems as well. I can't vouch for how the gamepad controls were adapted for other systems though, as I've only played the original Wii U version. And at the time I started putting all this together, that looked like the end of it. I expected this video to end with me eulogising the series, saying that Tecmo are showing no interest in doing anything more with it, and we're left with the worst game in the series is the only one officially available on modern systems. That's why 80% of this video was done using emulation, because of the aforementioned lack of western release for the fourth game, and because PS2 games look terrible on my setup. I'd have happily bought a HD collection just like I did for my recent Final Fantasy X-2 video, but there isn't one, so emulation it is. But now, as I'm releasing this video, I feel a little bit more optimistic. You see, a big part of why I fully expected to never see Mask of the Lunar Eclipse in the West is because of that Maiden of Blackwater release. It had all of these costumes celebrating the history of the series, with nothing referencing the fourth game. It seemed like Tecmo completely drawing a line under it and pretending it simply doesn't exist. And boy did that change. With the Project Zero 4 announcement that was made last month in the Nintendo Direct, I can honestly see the original trilogy getting a remaster before too long as well. After all, if they're willing to remaster a game that needs a full localization, a complete overhaul of the controls, and quite likely a lot of bug fixing, it feels like less work to also re-release games that don't need that same treatment. All the original trilogy needs is an upscale, which is still significant work, but of course, it's only a fraction of the work required for the fourth game, which is getting re-released. Another reason that I'm hopeful for a trilogy remaster is because in July, the developers of Identity V, a kind of Chinese Dead by Daylight, announced that one of its killers would get an outfit based on Sae from Project Zero 2. It seems really out of the blue for a game you can't officially play anywhere, so maybe that's a further hint at a remaster on the horizon. As far as I can tell, this collaboration has yet to actually release, so maybe they're holding off to release them together. Who knows? I certainly don't. This is just wild speculation. But all of this is positive, and I really can't wait for that Project Zero 4 remaster in all its official, non-emulated glory. And who knows, if that leads to a trilogy remaster and it all does well, then maybe we could start seeing some new games again. And which famed Japanese studio will co-develop this one? Platinum? Kojima? Maybe another internal Tecmo team and we get Project Zero Warriors, the hack and slash we're all craving? But seriously though, this is all great to see, and for me, this apparent resurgence is exciting because Project Zero is my favourite horror series. Resident Evil is fun, but it doesn't always land. Silent Hill has been weird in a bad way since 2004 and I simply cannot play stalker horror because it legitimately gives me panic attacks, so anything in that genre is out. But Project Zero is special to me, partly because it genuinely unnerves me, but there's a real sense of discovery and exploration with these games, of uncovering ancient secrets long buried. The Japanese settings give it a distinct identity, one that allows it to dig deep into folklore and myth in ways that other series can't really explore. There's a sense of darker forces at work in the world beyond our main characters, and the persistent boundary between the lands of the living and the dead, posing an ever-present threat, is always interesting to explore. And you know what? The camera-based gameplay is consistently brilliant. The idea that you have to really look at the horror in order to defeat it is an idea that forces the player to face their fear and dig deeper. It also makes each game feel like an investigation. Even in games when you're not a photojournalist or the apprentice to a photojournalist, the games are fundamentally about digging deep into the past and piecing it all together. And the fact that you carry a camera around with you as your primary defense just adds to that feeling. 
I've always adored this series, and even at its worst, with stories of sibling romance and team ninjas, trademark, it's still pretty good. And that's why I would love to see a revival bring the series the success it deserves and get more people finding out the true horrors of ropes. Happy Halloween, everybody. That's it! It's called Fatal Frame in America. That's what it's called. Of course it is.